Welcome back to Keeping Ag Real. This is Jenny Schweiger. I'm a mom, wife, chauffeur, sheep and cattle herder, front porch obsessor, and your host. Thanks for joining another episode of Keeping Ag Real. Today's episode is a topic that is kind of a little known secret. And our guest is Tracy Zirian. Well, welcome, Tracy. Well, thanks for letting me be a part of your show. This is pretty exciting for me. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So can you give a high-level view of what it is you do? (laughs) My history of custom harvesting goes way back. My grandpa and my grandma started doing this Well, shoot, Grandpa did it as a teenager, but he went on the road in the early 50s. What is a custom harvester? What does that mean for those that may not know? A custom harvester is a person or persons, a family, a business that has all of the equipment that's needed to go into a, a ripened field of wheat, of barley, of canola, of any grain that's ready to be harvested. And we have no interest in the field. All we are there is to provide a service for the farmer. So we we load up all of our equipment, our trucks, our our combines, our headers, our trailer houses, our families, and generally leave home sometime in May. And a lot of times these harvesters don't get back home again until until about Thanksgiving. If they're a family group, they do try to get the kids home if they're of age for school, but it's life on the road, usually four to six months. So that's what we do. So it's something that began with your grandfather? Yep. He was the one that created this monster. Um, I say that because I oftentimes even say that this custom harvesting industry is almost uh, like an addiction. It's something that is gets so bad into your blood that it's just when you finish a season, you're already starting to think about packing that trailer house and going again when you know you have to wait until April to even do it. So, you know, you might as well just get it out of your head. But it's being on the road. It's a gypsy lifestyle. And, yeah, we started Grandpa started that in the early 50s. I got asked to go with them when I was 13 years old. thought it would be a great time because I never got to really spend much time with them since we were gone all summer. Long story short, my husband was a hired man for them. The years evolved and we met each other and eventually got married. That sounds almost scandalous. (laughs) Well, you know those combine, right? (laughs) You know (laughs) You know, those combine dates, they're, I'm telling you, if you got daughters, you might as well just keep them out of the combines with those hired guys because sometimes they end up falling in love with them. I'm glad I have all boys. <laughs> well, you need to tell them then to keep those girls out of the combines and trucks. But see, we had four daughters, so we were lucky to get through that. Of course, we didn't have any hired men either, so that probably had something to do with it. But anyways, when we got married, we never intended to be a custom harvester. Jim was an electrician. We just never even thought about it. And then it was at a time very much like now. Well, it was early 80s. So the pick program was just coming in, and there was a lot of stuff going on. But my dad and my grandpa thought they needed one more combine, so they asked us. And that's how it started for us. When you traveled, your girls are all adult age now. But when they were younger and you traveled, did you homeschool? Or did one of you make it back home so they could go to public school? We were really, really fortunate in that we lived in a small community at the time that had a two-room school. So we had, so when the two older girls were in school, it worked out really well for us because that two-room school understood what we were doing. We didn't start to have any problems with anything until they had to go to junior high and high school. And then they started threatening with, you know, if you're not here then we start taking credits away from you. So then it was hard because we had to kind of fish out our kids to neighbors and family for a while. But, you know, they got along. It was fine. It was only usually about, mm, I don't know, four weeks at the most of being away from us. That's the best thing about community. Yes, exactly. And it was good for the girls because they learned something other than what they were used to, and they came to appreciate us more as well Right. that way. So where do you travel? Where do you start? Our route has never really been consistent. It generally starts in Texas and works its way up to 
Montana, usually. It's like the number of miles that you've clocked during a season. What would probably get things a little bit goofy is that now there's only just the two of us again. The girls are gone. They don't go with us. So it's just me and Jim. So we're back to backtracking. It takes us two trips. So when we leave one farm and go to the next, we make one trip and we drive back, get the rest of the equipment, and we go back for a second time. So, you know, they used to call it a 2,000-mile trip, so we'll go with that. But there's going to be more miles than that. Is the going back and forth, is that something that maybe leads people to leave harvesting? What's going to prevent them and it's going to make this industry tough is the same situation that the farmers have with the commodity prices being so low. This last season was extremely challenging for you. And I remember a year before that, you and I had discussed things were probably going to get tough in the near future. Can you talk about the challenges? This past summer in particular was like none, that, nothing that we've ever experienced. Like I said, when we got started, we started in the early 80s, so we were coming into this industry when it was a tough time with pick programs and acres down and blah, blah, blah. Well, this year beat that. It was a situation when we left this spring, we knew that the wheat acres were the lowest planted in 100 years, so we already knew that the acres were down. What we didn't really count on was the weather playing such havoc on so many people. Because if you remember, and it's not been that long ago, we had a huge drought in the northern country from northern Nebraska clear to the Canadian border. I mean, it was huge. And those are those are huge wheat acres. Those are huge lentils and whatever else that they grow up there anymore. They were just gone. It was gone. And that took a lot of the harvesters completely out of production. Most of the time when you have a situation like that, your drought is like, you know, over here and maybe over here, but it's not so widespread affecting so many thousands of acres. So we had harvesters that were really without anything to do for up to two months, and it, it really hurt. For us in particular, we had our Texas job, and we weren't even done with our Texas job, and we found out that job number three, which was Colorado, was being killed off because of the drought. So we lost job number three, and then three days later, we get a phone call from job number two that this huge hailstorm wiped out everything. Oh. So here we were just days away of finishing Texas, and Jim and I just, I mean, we were sick. We didn't know where do you even start? What do you do? We had nothing to do for much of the m month of July and August. So we did the best we could. You know, we, we, we relied on friends who pulled through for us and we were able to get some acres in Kansas. We were able to get some acres in Nebraska. Then we went up into Montana and we actually worked for a farmer up in Chester, Montana. I ran a combine, Jim ran a truck. We didn't take our equipment, but we helped them with their harvest for about three weeks. And the best part of all of this is that for the very first time since 1990, we were home in July. And that was good because we got to welcome our third grandbaby. That would not have happened had everything been like it should have been. Right. So, I mean, there was this, there was a good thing. I love that about you. Always looking and finding that silver lining and trying to be as positive as possible in some of the most challenging situations. you got to be. But it was tough. I mean, it, it, if you can't find those positive things, it really makes life and everything else just kind of in the pit. So you got to look for the positive. And it's contagious. <laughs> here just in our house you know one person can be negative and then it just is a snowball effect oh yeah but if you you know do something silly and start getting everyone laughing which is <laughs> the number three's job is to make everybody laugh then you've got a more positive attitude you have a number three like that as well yes I think that that's oh. like par for the course for things, number threes. It, it must be. It must absolutely be. Because if it wasn't for our number three being our spice <laughs> in the family, <laughs> seriously, I mean, still to this day, she is she is the one that keeps everybody going. It's, it's incredible. It is a challenge. But I'm going to tell you something, Jenny. 
these girls of mine have grown up to become some of the most responsible and strong women. I mean, they, they are adults now. Our baby is 20. And I can see and I look at them and think, wow, I must have done something right because they just never cease to amaze me with how strong they are and how close they are. They are so close. And that's a good thing. Almost to the point where I feel a little bit jealous because I don't get to be a part of their group, you know, Aww. but I have to think that that's okay because, you know, I'm supposed to be the mom. I'm not supposed to be a part of their group. So I, I feel like this all happened because of the harvesting, because of the responsibilities, because of the different challenges that they also had to be a part of. They were there right there with Jim and I the whole time. And did you live in a, in like a travel trailer? 40 foot space. Yep, we said we sure did. And let me tell you, sometimes those rainy days, sometimes that could be a little bit much. <laughs> I can imagine. Yes, it was close quarters. We did it. There's a sign that I have hanging up down in my main floor of this tiny little house that we have, but it says, you know, small houses build large love. And that is so true. It is so true because you are stuck with each other. Right. You can't just run off and hide because uh, there's usually somebody that's about 10 foot away from you. Right. From just being a custom harvester, you were kind of inspired to bring more women into almost a community. These are women that are also doing custom harvesting, but they're also doing other types of harvesting too. That also was something I didn't realize, the number of custom harvesters that are women. I had no idea. And you know, it also, and this would be a topic for a whole other show, but it begs the question of how are those women being counted in all of the stat? Well, that's a good question because I don't even think that there's even a number of custom harvesters that have been counted. I've, I've been asked that question quite often. How many custom harvesters are out there? I don't know. I mean, how can you how can you know that? There's no numbers. There's no data. You know, the more folks that are at doing custom work is growing, and and this is maybe maybe there's an answer to it, and I just don't know the answer to that. But I wonder, you know, how does all of that play into the statistics, and are the statistics even correct? Yeah, I don't know, but I do know. I I, I hate to even think about this though, Jenny too, but. Our industry has been pretty consistent with the way that it runs as far as the job that we do. But the custom harvesters really depend on those wheat acres because, you know, you get if you can get three months, two and a half, three months of wheat cut, and then you run into the fall crop, you make that money that you need to have to continue to have the equipment that you have to pay for your labor, to pay for your insurance, and, and keep your business going. But what I saw this summer, and I, I kind of have a feeling that we're going to look at it again next year, is that the wheat acres are down, and you throw in the, the stupid weather that none of us have control over, and you've got harvesters out there that are looking for a job because they just don't have anything. And farmers are taking that wheat, those wheat acres, and they're turning them into something else, a lot more soybeans, a lot more corn, which goes into the fall crop. And with the fall crops, you don't have that gradual ripening like you do with the wheat. You can't go from Texas to Montana. Right. You're kind of stuck. So... I don't know. It, it's going to be interesting. I think I think we're going to see some changes in our industry. I, I hope it doesn't just completely kill it, but I think there's going to be some changes. It'll be interesting to see how the future rolls out for you in the next yeah. 12 to 18 months. I think so. I think I read some stats on this on a study that the wheat acres are being decreased. You know, the price also plays into all of that, but the whole gluten-free. Yeah, it really makes life tough. Part of what you saw was that there was something missing that told the general public, hey, there's this, there's this industry out there that you don't even know about. And how can I communicate that? And something called Harvest Her was born. What was the inspiration besides just communicating with the general public? Probably five years ago, I was the first female president of the U.S. Custom Harvesters Association, and I served in that position for three years. At that time, I really felt like, you know, I was doing the women of the industry 
justice by being at that position. But I had an elderly woman come up to me. She was an elderly harvester's wife. And she made a comment to me that really hurt at that time. But it's something that created harvester and where it's at now. But her comment to me was, why don't you ever give women the credit that they deserve? Why don't you ever acknowledge them for what they do and for the job that they do during the summer? And I kind of thought, well, that's kind of weird because I always kind of thought that I was acknowledging and giving the women the credit that they deserved. But I guess I wasn't. It wasn't until about two years ago, there was some changes in my life that allowed me to, all at once this idea came to me to begin this Facebook page and I titled it Harvester. I got the idea because of the farm her. So I contacted Margie and I asked her if she felt that there would be any reason that I would be doing anything that could be detrimental to what she was doing if I created the Harvester. And she said that she didn't see any problem with it. So it was born. Yeah, it was. It was, that's what started it. But I didn't know what to do with it. I mean, I created this Facebook page and I had no clue what the heck am I going to do with this now. I talked to a couple of my friends who are harvest wives and they agreed to kind of give me like um, updates, harvest updates and pictures. Those two created more women that were more involved and more excited about it. And two years later now, we've got, gosh, I don't know. 40, close to 4,500 followers on the Facebook page. Wow, congratulations. I was pretty excited about it. And and so much interest. I mean, worldwide interest. As a matter of fact, I have just put on a post from South Australia. And she at first was like, well, I don't feel like I'm probably capable of doing this. I don't live this crazy, wonderful custom harvesting lifestyle. I said, I don't care. What you're doing is showing everybody what your life is all about right now. You're trying to help your husband in the wheat field in Australia. You have two young children. You know, tell your story. Tell the people out there what it takes to do the job that you're doing to get their food on their table. So I'm excited. That's very exciting. And, you know, one of the reasons I started this podcast was because there were, I think that there's been a movement, not because of my podcast, but because of peers, where people are finally feeling like they can tell their stories without being criticized. That was what I wanted to do with mine, is making sure that people knew, no matter what it is, that is your truth. Nobody else is living your life. Nobody else can tell your story, because it's your story. Right. And the more we do that, I think the more confident we're going to become as a community, as well as the general public, are going to become interested and want to learn more. And why the heck wouldn't they? Anybody who lives a different lifestyle than what you do yourself is interesting. What what you do, Jenny, is very interesting to me. And what I do, when people find interest in what I do, I look at them and think, how is this interesting? This is just my job. I don't see where where you find this so interesting. And, and and let me tell you this, when we're talking about people finding things interesting, when we were in Kansas this summer, we were followed by three Germans. They came from Germany specifically to do a documentary on their public TV channel. They wanted to, to follow us and they wanted to follow another harvester friend of ours who was in the area. And they were so So, I mean, they were almost giddy because they were just so excited to be in the combine and seeing something as large as our machine with 35 foot head. They don't have that. That is awesome. And it was just, we got to tell our story again. Right. In a different language. (laughs) So did they do like voiceovers in German? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And you know. Wow. What's really funny is there's a conversation between Jim and I, and and I kind of had a little bit of an attitude with my tone. So you hear this... You hear this voiceover who's supposed to be me with her little attitude, and I'm thinking, well, I probably better, I probably better try to calm myself down here. And my attitude showed through. Yeah, I mean, there's no reason why you can't have an attitude from time to time, right? <laughs> I think I deserve it. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, think about this. I'm not going to put anybody down because I don't want it to sound like that. It's fun to step back and watch farmer's wives talk about their two or three weeks worth of harvest. 
and what pains that they go through. Now put that times four, Mm -hmm. because that's what we live, being one-on-one with my husband for, you know, four months at a time. I live with him. I work with him. He's there all the time. Of course I get an attitude. I'm sure he does as well. But that's your story. That's our story. And by telling that, people, you know, like me, who didn't even have a clue that that existed, you've completely opened my eyes. And that's what I hope that people who visit the Harvester website or the Harvester Facebook page, they see that. They see those stories of those women. And those stories are very similar. And what that has done, it has created a community of people who relate. They understand whether you're a harvester, whether you're a farmer's wife, you know, everybody goes through that. Everybody has the same thoughts. Everybody has those same feelings. But at the time, they think you're the, you're the only one. So what this has done is it has created a spot people can see, oh, wow, the little gal that's just to do in the post tomorrow, she's a young girl, not young girl, but a young woman. She's got two little kids. She's trying to do the harvest. There's going to be so many people that will relate to what she's doing and going through. We've got her back, you know? Absolutely. I'm excited, but I'm even more excited for this event that you have that's coming up that's really going to take Harvest Her to the next level. And while you've shared some details with me that I can't tell, I know that there's other really exciting things going on that you'll release, but just not quite yet. What can you tell us, I guess? I've had this dream since I created Harvester's Facebook page of this weekend that would bring these gals together and would allow them to meet each other face to face. It would give them time to to support each other, to build relationship, to create a wellness type retreat that I could provide for them just prior to them packing their trailer house and loading their families up and hitting the road again. And I just did it. So we're still trying to build on. So you've got to, you've got to uh, stay with me here as it continues, because I think it's going to be a really awesome weekend. Oh, for sure. And it's in April. I want this to be something that these gals are just so excited that they'll come from Montana. They'll come from Texas. They'll come from Oklahoma to be together with each other for a weekend, kind of like a quilting bee with no quilt. You know, the old fashioned quilting bees where all these women would get together and sit and talk and hash out their lives was around a quilt. And we don't do that anymore. No, we don't. Yeah. Stay tuned. Gosh, I wish I was a harvester. (laughs) Hey, I'm telling you, you are a harvester. You should just come. Oh, I would love to, but I'll be 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 harvesting lambs. Probably about that. See, you are a harvester. <laughs> oh, <laughs> the group isn't just custom harvesters of wheat or small grains. No. You have no. women that are picking beans and beyond. Almonds. Almonds? Yeah. Yeah. And there was a gal who I think it probably just got to be too busy for her, but cranberries. She was going to write for it and and, be, and participate, and I thought, wow, this is this will be great. People don't know anything about cranberry harvest or almond harvest, you know? Right, or walnut. Yeah, just met a walnut farmer or rancher is how they refer to them out in California. I knew nothing about walnuts. No clue. There's so much to that that market. See, so much more than I. I never would have thought of it. Any of it. It's bringing those people together. Yes. And it's that personal connection that grows not only the community, but we each individually grow. And that's what's so important and so incredible about this idea and this event. It's it's very scary because there's nothing that I can base any of this off of. It's all new to me. It's all new. And, and I don't want it to be large. I want it to be small enough that people, you know, I'm renting a house for crying out loud. So you can't have that many people. So I'm thinking and hoping 25 at the most. And I, and I think it's just going to be really close and intimate, and, it, and it's going to be good. You have to start somewhere, and some of the best, the greatest accomplishments in this world were started small and worked their way up. So it'll give you right. goals for the next event. See, I'm, right. I'm already right. planning your next event. That's awesome. I'm going <laughs> to keep you, I'm going to keep, I'm going to make you hold true to that. But you know what? I am a person, Jenny, who does not believe in the word impossible. If anybody really knows me, they know that I will persevere until I can get that 
done, whether it's unscrewing something, trying to put something together, or beginning something brand new as this as this harvester get together. I'm I will persevere and I will push through. Amen, sister. Yeah, I'm excited to see what happens. Do you want to share the specific dates? Sure, I can. April 13th through the 15th. Be in the middle of April, like I said before, it's going to be a, a motivational. It's going to be an encouraging. It's going to be something that these women will know that they've got somebody to help them through the next season of harvest that, that they've got to look forward to. So um, I think it's going to be good. And it's not just custom harvesters. It's anybody out there. It's 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 the women who jump on this Facebook page and make comments. It's just so genuine and so real. And that is what I find very interesting. We are at the end of our time together. But I would like anyone that's listening to please go and visit the Facebook page because you can't completely appreciate what's happening there until you have actually been on there. So please, please visit that. And then do you have a Twitter account as well? I do. And it's um, just at Harvester. And then we have website and it's Harvester.com. Excellent. People can reach out and contact you through the website, Harvester.com through the Facebook page, Harvest Her, or through the Twitter account, at Harvest Her. It's been fun, a lot of fun. Thank you so much for letting me be a part of it. It's fun to get to share it because, like I said, you know, it's something that to me is just me and what I, my job is and what I'm working on. But to see somebody else's excitement, it just encourages me and makes me get all excited about it again. And putting people together. I love it. That's what we need to do. We need to get people more together, more connected. Spot on. Well, thank you, Tracy, for being on Keeping Ag Real. All of the information about Tracy's social media accounts will be listed in the notes. And thanks again for joining another episode of Keeping Ag Real.